Okay, let's start. China, China. Let me first just introduce myself. I'm um, Jacqueline Batchelor. I work at the University of Johannesburg in the Faculty of Education, situated within the Department of Science, Technology, Education. My speciality and my field of expertise is mobile technology use in emerging environments and specifically looking towards um, innovative pedagogy and how do we use the is to empower our teachers. So the first slide, and this is really a beautiful one, <laughs> there's a cry for, you know, let's start to train the trainers and the trainers of the trainers and the trainers for the trainers, but yet we have not really a, a clear idea of uh, who the trainers are and what we expect of them and how we should go about our training them to try and filter all this information down to the base of the pyramid. Now, so one of the concerns that have been raised in the past is that during training workshops, there's different levels of training. And the question that has been posed in the past is how do we cascade the essence of that training down from the master trainer level? And when we look at master trainers, usually these are people that are really at the pinnacle of their, their profession. They are domain experts in their, their content knowledge. They are very knowledgeable with regard to technological use. They're also very knowledgeable about pedagogical issues with regard to um, learning preferences and um, all of those. And usually when we do master training, the master training, the timeline for master training is usually quite long. Um, it's usually very specialist orientated and it, it, the time frame is more or less five days um, that we try and equip these master trainers for all, in the, all eventualities. And then it cascades down to the master trainers then train regional trainers. And because of cost, usually cost and um, limitations, those are not um, five days. They don't have the luxury of five days. So they have to condense it all into two days training. And then that cascades down to your local trainers that is usually um, also for a short period of time. And then those local trainers run the workshops. The workshop usually stretches out, usually a one-day workshop, and those then take place within school environments. Now, the problem that we face is that when we cascade training, and you can see in this picture, you have your master trainer here at the top, reaches a hand down, pulls someone else up, and the, the strength starts to weaken as, as you go down to the second level of training. And the implications are there that at the master level, you can reach all your objectives. But as soon as you go down one level and even a further level, then it starts to dilute, your solutions start to dilute and your effectiveness becomes um, less pronounced. And there are reasons for that. First of all, the first one is the training duration. The fact that master trainers have the luxury of five days of intervention quality of the training and also then the level of support that, that can be um, can be leveled. If I go back one slide, we can see that your master trainers only have access, the numbers start increasing exponentially towards the bottom of the pyramid, where you have your local trainers that is really responsible for the larger part um, of the training um, in, in, in the wider scope of things. So it becomes problematic for them because their knowledge is less, their time on hand is less, and then also they don't have that um, level of support that they can they can offer to everyone. I don't know if anybody has a comment at this point um, on the um, the thought of the dilution or, or um, the dissolving of the solution as you go down in the different levels. So further you go away from your master trainer level, the um, the effectiveness of the trainer starts to, to lessen. And I don't know if anybody else has encountered this in their training as well. I can see that Elizabeth is madly typing away and we'll wait for her comment. And whilst we go to the, the next slide. Now, when we train um, in the teaching environment, and especially with technology, we need to recognize the fact that we have a multitude of different devices that we're confronted with in our in our, in our teaching space. Um, 
we have, you can see in this slide, it is not uni the technological solutions are not universal. And because we have the different philosophies of bring your own device into training or the one-to-one -one device in training, um, the solutions vary dramatically. Okay, now I can see people are typing away, but nothing is actually appearing on my screen. I don't know if, um, Adele, if you can spot anything happening there or not. Okay, so let us just pause for a moment with Elizabeth's comment. Um, state that you agree. We run five-day Indigenous cultural practice work program for facilitators. This transfers down to one-day training for staff and health. In some cases, for clinicians due to their workload is down to four hours. Now that, I think it's a universal problem because it's of a pragmatic nature where we can't, um, we can't expect, if we're running a master training workshop for five days where we are infusing um, technology use and trying to cover all type of scenario, training scenarios, if we cascade that down to our first level, yes, we still can be quite effective even in a one day training session. But the moment we condense it into a short period of time where there's only one instance that we need to fit in within a working day, then it becomes really problematic. And as we agree there, um, the inferior quality of the training becomes evident due to the fact that, as you stated before, I don't know if, if, if at this point I can ask you to identify um, factors that would impact on that quality that inferior quality, because the assumption is there that it is because of the um, domain, the domain knowledge of the, the lack of domain knowledge of those, the, the um, local trainers, or it is um, with regard to the lack of technological knowledge, or it could be more towards the specific nature of the training, the training that did not prepare them for um, eventualities of contextual um, environmental factors. Um, so it will be interesting if you can maybe um, contribute your thoughts at this space with regard to what could we contribute that um, the inferior quality of the of the training as it cascades down to the different levels. Um, at the moment, our assumption is that it is the domain expertise and the lack of technological expertise, but um, it is not always the case. So it will be interesting if some of you can maybe contribute your thoughts to the factors that would limit, um, limit the quality of that training. Right, so we see that if I go move back to the slide at this point in time, Elizabeth and Marie is typing madly, so I'll, um, I'll leave them there for a while. Elizabeth, uh, let me just read your comment. Um, the master training comes with the potential of years of experience, yes, domain knowledge and practice, yet the next level down is learning as they train. Now, learning as they train, if I understand you correctly by that, with that comment, it would, to me, mean that they, they don't have those, the domain knowledge, the, the content knowledge in, in actual fact then. Um, so they're picking up at the same time that they are training with the technology, they're also training in the content. So it's a dual, appro a dual approach um, at that, that point in time. And because then it's a dual approach and I don't have the authority for the content knowledge, um, it then dilutes their training effectiveness, which makes, um, which makes a lot of sense. And that is why it is one of the critical factors is when you're picking your trainers, you need to look at what is their domain knowledge, what is their knowledge of expertise, and what is their influence within that space. If I go to the next slide, um, and I want to move straight to the, the ICT, because if you move, look at the previous slide, I'm jumping backwards and forwards now, but if you look at the previous slide, there are a few choices that we need to make when we are looking at master training and also training specifically. Within master training, we, you, we basically try and cover all the eventualities with regard to the choice of ICT. However, there are some limitations, and therefore we need to to make a choice with regard to what are we going to, to utilize in a specific training environment. And um, training, as anything in life, is very contextual. It is influenced by the environment in which you train. 
Now I'm going to go over quite a um, just a number of these different um, factors that impact um, they impact the choice of, of ICTs. And at the same time, whilst I'm doing that, I'm just glancing at the screen here with a dull commenting. If a person was expert, would there be no need to train? And I think the, the question that I would like to pose to adult or the answer or the response to that is, if there is content knowledge, it does not necessarily mean that I have the, the knowledge of the technological solution, how to harness the potential of the technology to, um, to make accessible the content for learning purposes. So the integration of the content as well as the technology becomes paramount. Marie has a comment here, she says, I think in South Africa it is because the state determines what the educators must be taught. They concentrate on the curriculum, but not the inclusion of ICT skills to improve learning and engaging of learners. Um, Marie, that, that is an assumption, I think, at the moment that the um, South African government is trying to address. Um, the content, yes, has been standardised. However, because of our differing in uh, different contexts, because we, we have a, a really diverse society. And um, by the way, today we are celebrating our Heritage Day in South Africa, which is the um, celebration of our history, of our ancestry, and of our diversity. Um, and that fits beautifully with the rest, this training um, module, and I'll cover that a little bit later. Now, to get back to the ICT integration, oh yes, by the way, Heritage Day in South Africa, we celebrate in the form of a barbecue day. It's a national barbecue day, or national braai day, as we would call it. And today is a beautiful day across South Africa. We enjoy beautiful sunshine, and people are out and about just um, taking a moment to, to celebrate their uniqueness and um, the, diverse, the diverse differences amongst each other. So that's, that's really something to celebrate. And I think that is what we're also trying to do when we are doing training. And I'll get to that in the, in the last slide. So I have um, empathy for everybody that is at the office at the moment. <laughs> and um, I even came to office because I was not really sure of the, um, my connectivity at home, which brings me to the choice of ICT. When we choose technology for training, we need to be cognizant of our environment. First of all, there are physical limitations. Example, interrupted electricity supply. I think in more developing contexts, you have assured um, electricity supply. However, across the world, in many different regions, that is not such a surety. As demonstrated recently, in India, they had massive power failures across different regions. In South Africa, we suffer because of the violent um, electrical storms. We often have electricity supply shortages and outages. Um, let me see here, Dal. Users need five years on technology to become confident enough to contribute. Hmm. Yeah, that is a very interesting comment. And um, it will be interesting if you can find the, the reference to that, Dal. I think everybody would be able to benefit from that. Um, secondly, we, the choice of ICT, we need to look at the competency, and that feeds into Adele's comment there, that it takes five years for someone to become um, confident enough to contribute um, in an environment. And then we're confronted with the number, the variety, um, and compatibility of the tools that we are, uh, that flood um, the market. Connectivity remains a big issue in developing context, not so much in the developed world, but even across our urban areas, connectivity is not always assured. And that um, leads to the confrontation of how do you train um, in a space where there is no connectivity, where you rely on resources that have been developed to be um, made available on a continuous basis. And connectivity also then has implications for um, updating resources. Example, if I create uh, training material and it's a once-off and I go into an environment where there's no connectivity and I can download the resources for them, then it's very difficult to upgrade those because you can think, if, if there was connectivity, they can synchronize to the new resources, the latest um, possible other uh, training material that is made available on a continuous basis. But the moment you take the connectivity away, that falls away. Policy issues, 
So the one time frame, time zones, especially in the country, um, we have to move across them. Um, speed, clarity of services, context, and cultural issues. I'll get to the cultural issues a little bit later. Curriculum demands. Um, and this brings you to the fact that uh, the curriculums can be either static or it could be very dynamic. Um, especially in the health industry, um, it needs to be reflexive to the environment, needs to be able to update um, on a continuous basis. So the curriculum dictates the, the training material and the resources that will be used as well. Then collaboration across borders. Now, the choice of ICT and how that pertains to collaboration across borders is uh, borders, I understand, uh, borders not with regard to physical borders, but borders across gender, across religion, across um, many different type of, of um, levels of literacy. So it is how do we collaborate across language borders, across um, our common understanding and value systems. Um, that becomes problematic when we choose our ICTs. Ownership and accountability, that is a big issue with training. Um, that brings, again, the whole question of bring your own device to one-to-one -to -one ownership, personal versus institutionally owned, the cost implications to that, and then also the degree of technological permeation um, within a society. The, we find that also has a huge effect on the choice of ICT for training. And the importance here is that the more technology is available within the society or that community, the bigger the uptake will be of the training material and also of the more receptive the, the trainees would be to the training because there will be familiarity with outside of the domain of just the, the training environment. So that all of these play into that area. And now that brings you to the next slide, which is trying to stay current. Because trying to stay current means that we try and train with the technology that the people have available at that time in their life, which means that we need to be reflexive with regard to the emerging technologies on a constant basis. They are technologies that we can define them. Um, they are technologies which, which arise from new knowledge, from innovative applications, from, um, and, and as the slide indicates, it has long-lasting systemic implications, not just um, for our economic, but also for our social and political spheres. And then we also need to look at how it can disrupt industries. And we can see now that the new technologies here have been able to disrupt education in a dramatic sense. If I can share some of them from our context recently, we've had a, a, a textbook delivery catastrophe where one of our regions, we have nine different regions in South Africa, and one whole region um, suffered a, a supply chain um, collapse in the sense where the whole region did not receive textbooks for approximately six months of the school year, which meant that those learners with, without any um, learning resources. Now, if you merge that scenario with emerging technologies, then you have the potential to address um, that specific solution. But that brings back the training of the trainers. How do we train in mass trainers that are comfortable with technology, that are knowledgeable in the field of curriculum, that have the authority to train adults that are already professionals in their own right, that are that will be receptive to these new technologies. And that brings us to this whole mobile learning framework. And that is where the choice of technologies now come in. Okay, now I don't know if anybody would, at this moment in time would like to pass a comment with regard to where we are going with the, um, the presentation. But I'm sure you are familiar with the um, the e-learning framework from the GSMA, and what they tried to do was they conceptualised in a model um, the different levels of how they would see the, the stakeholders 
or not necessarily the stakeholders, but the influences within developing mobile learning solutions. And if you start at the top, you look at your technology with your voice, SNS, your USSD, the low in phones, all have the same capability. You're looking at your, um, your feature phones, they have um, mobile web, Bluetooth, GPRS capabilities, and then you have your smartphones with the applications um, that can run on them now. We also have the different modes of delivery that play into this context, your synchronous and asynchronous, formal and informal learning, and teaching environments. And then you have these different learning areas, the methods and the players that are involved. Now, when we design training solutions, we have to keep this very firmly in mind because this would determine the choice of technology. If we're looking at what is available in that specific society, whether it is more low-end, more feature or more smart technology, um, you have to then um, customize your curriculum and your training material for that. Now, I think that is why when you start to integrate technology into our training, it is perceived as a very wicked, wicked problem. Um, it is demanded, as earlier indicated, I can't remember who it was, that um, the assumption was that it's very different. I think it was Marie that stated um, that the state still determines what the educators uh, must be taught and that there's very little integration of ICT. However, at the moment, there is huge expectation of integration. We see this in our UNESCO policies, we see this in the Commonwealth of Learning training material where there's huge emphasis on integration of technologies. But then we also note that we have multiple role players that do not really know how to start even addressing this problem um, and where to go in future. Then we're also looking at the, the players in the field. There's a lot of NGOs, there's a lot of software companies that are trying to muscle in on, on in the space and they have a very utopian outlook on the technology um, potential and they don't have a, a, a very strong research agenda or a theory building agenda and what our government specifically has done in the past few years if they've embarked on a, um, a approach of proof of practice where any company or NGO approached them, they said, yes, you can start in a school, but we need proof of concept. In other words, we need the proof that there's, a, there's actual learning taking place. There's advantages to using certain solutions within your space, but then also that there's quality assurance um, that have um, taken place and impact studies before we will escalate it into any in a um, bigger arena. And then the other thing with integrating technology, other, another problem is the fact that there are rapid changes in the field and the options seem to be endless. And as soon as we design one solution to a particular problem, there's the next technological solution. And how do we re stay responsive? And we found that the, there are different strategies that have been applied. Um, the, the problems or the, the strategies are these four major approaches. The first one is the top-down versus a participatory page solution. We have a, a top-down um, type of a approach where usually organizations or governments have said, okay, this needs to happen, this is our policy, um, we need to put it in place by X, num X years, how are we going to do it, there's money thrown at the problem and it's expected that it would go away. And we don't and we often see that these approaches fail because there's not much participation. The moment you can increase participation, that would mean that your solutions will become a little bit more sustainable. We also have the global versus the local solutions. The local um, solutions are often perceived as inferior, whereas the global solutions are perceived to be of a higher standard. However, um, in that mindset, it's, it doesn't address the contextual issues and that also leads to failure. Um, Marie, I'm just reading your comment on the right hand side. I think, it is, I think it is that the education must change their mindset, must be prepared to leave what they know and develop new skills that will be included in their teaching. The framework is an excellent place for educators to start. I, um, I agree with you in that sense because so, they need to start at some point because we can't just stay um, you know, static forever. 
Um, the other strategy here um, that is one of my my favourite ones that I need I spend a lot of time on. It is the technological versus the social solutions. Often we look at technology and think, yes, this new iPad, this new Galaxy Tab, this new um, smartphone is the solution to our problem. However, it does not include any social con uh, social aspects. We do not look at the people when we are designing the, the solutions. We're looking at the technology to, ser to solve all our problems. And um, in actual fact, sometimes it creates even more problems. Then the last one is the optimism versus the pessimism. And uh, there might be, um, but that is a strategy of we have an almost evangelical approach to technological solutions in education. Um, we throw, there's a huge amount of money that is being spent at this point in time without any proof of concept. Um, and we are not sure, and the comment here from Adele, I think the problem is that the use of technology does not directly relate to the mark or test marks or assessment. In other words, often the question is asked, yes, we spend so much money in introducing whiteboards in classrooms, but how much or how has our education improved? What is the percentage of marks of our learners? Um, you know, and there's very little out there that actually documents this over a longitudinal period of time. Um, yes, Alina, there is a, the students are more motivated when they use technology, yet does that motivation then translate into increased um, performance? Um, does it lead to greater engagement? Yes, but does that then transfer into better academic um, accreditation? And I'm just reading the comments here as I'm glancing here to the right. The problem is I'm seeing it's less clear. Institutions sometimes simply require staff to acquire the technology to innovate. And I think, um, Paige, you are hitting something on the nail here because a lot of staff are, are expected to innovate. But they innovate, they are not, it's not really clearly defined with regard to what is expected with regard to innovation. Innovation in teaching, innovation in our using of technology for certain solution. Um, you know, so the expect institutional expectations are quite high, yet there's often a lack of training. Um, let us get to the next slide. Okay, now what is the role of technology in training? And it's about three things. It's the learning about technology, yes. It is learning with technology and it is learning through technology. And I think the one cannot be without the other. It needs to coexist. Um, and it is to bring about experiences not possible without technology. And I think this is where we come back to the comment of, um, of Adelina from Portugal, which says students are more motivated when they use technology. And I, I would agree with that because it is about bringing experiences to the learner and to the teacher that are not possible without the use of technology. Um, and the comment here from Elizabeth here, with indigenous children in remote communities, at times, children are more motivated to learn through technology and this student through the use of XO laptops, in particular remote community literacy and numeracy results improved dramatically. Now, what is important here, Elizabeth, is that I'm hoping that that was documented somewhere. And if it is, it will be brilliant if you can make that available to the, to the community. Because often we are confronted with um, return on investment. Yes, we spend so much on technology, but what is the return on investment? Um, how much has the literacy levels improved? To what percentage can we actually put um, quantitative data to that effect? Um, I'm just reading the comments here. Bad teaching with technology is just expensive as bad teaching. <laughs> that is very true. <laughs> um, it is just a, a waste of time in, in effect because it, it equips a bad teacher with good technology and they will just remain bad at what they're doing. Um, 
Right, Alina here is commenting in Portugal that the learners use their own mobile phones to access information about micro stories and so on. And um, that is a great comment because if we go back to here, they are learning through technologies that are using their mobile phones, but at the same time they're also getting more or becoming more familiar with technology. So let us quickly move to the next one. We need to, when we're looking at all of these different technologies and the solutions, we keep, need to keep in mind what the ethical, our ethical responsibility is towards um, training with technology and training through technology and training about technology. It has to do with our future ethics. Because we're not just training today, we're training, we have an intervention, we leave a society, we leave, sometimes in certain cases, we leave technology with them and we step away. And often the question is, what happens after that fact? Um, because there are implications for that community in the future. We have a social ethic responsibility. We have an ethics of nature. The ethics of nature it has to do with sustainability for our environment, the resources that we are using, um, where do they stem from, um, what is their lifespan, what will happen to them at the end of their life. And then we have the ethics of democracy, because technology is not agnostic to, um, to politics, to um, civil society. It is in, there's a lot of, um, and I would need to be careful here how I phrase it, but it is value laden, um, the embedded within the technology, our cultural orientations and our different type of solutions. Oh, I now missed quite a lot of these comments. There seems to be a separate conversation happening on the side, and I'm just trying to pick that up quickly. I'll pause for two seconds. Elizabeth, thank you for that article. Um, we will pick that up in certain time. Or you can also contribute that to the Google Groups. OK, now Nelly asked the question, how does technology facilitate learning? And I think we, but thank you for that. I think Elizabeth will get to that. That brings me to the teaching and learning theory. Thank you for that question with regard to facilitate learning. And we need to take into to account that when we're looking at teaching and learning theory, if you're looking at your behaviorism, your constructivism, your instructivism, your um, you need to recognize the fact that your environment does not just comprise of technology, but also of people, of resources, of physical and your virtual environment also play a role in there. And we need to also recognize the fact that we are trying to move away from the knowledge transmission model, where there was only one authority, where that was the teacher that is standing in front of the classroom. And we need to move more towards the generative knowledge models, where it's more of a facilitator, more of um, enabling learning um, as a collaboration between partners. And that also, because we need to recognize the fact that we need to move away from the knowledge transmission models, we also need to remember that our training needs to simulate that. Um, recently, there was a training event in the Copa Barber district, I think Adele, in your webinar, you reflected on it, where we decided on an approach, because it is in a rural environment in a very traditional setting, we decided that the approach would be to start with technology integration in a more behavioristic way, because that is the way that those teachers are familiar, um, are, it's, they're familiar with that, that type of approach, they do that in their everyday teaching and learning environment. They are the only authority um, with regard to the only access to resources. And the approach was to start from a behavioristic model and then slowly move across into a more constructivist approach. But yet, when the facilitation started and the training happened, it moved much faster from a behavioristic point of view to a um, constructivist perspective. Um, so that brings us to the point where we reconceptualized the training material and we thought, okay, let us move away then. Let us not even consider doing any type of training in a behavioristic way and move straight to constructivist model. Because what you model in your training is what the teachers are going to model in their classrooms. 
So that was a very much a the knowledge transmission and knowledge generative models. That was a big eye opener in that training. The other thing to consider is the perceived and real affordances of the the pedagogy and what the technology brings to that space. And then also the blended teaching environments. And now I'd, I'd like to spend a few minutes with regard to um, the affordances or the, the perceived affordances of mobile technology. On the one hand, we've got the positive and also on the negative. And whilst I'm going through the slide, because when I was thinking of the, um, the negative affordances, I don't know, there, there must be other negative affordances. And I don't know if you could, if, if you would like to type on the rest, on the right hand side, other negative affordances of introducing or using mobile technology for training. Um, Nelly on the side, I did my um, doctoral dissertation on teacher experience of technology in blended learning environments in higher education. Oh, that is brilliant, Nelly. If you could post that to the, um, the Google's group that we were forming, that would be brilliant because um, we could share that with, with everyone. Um, and I think that would be, please share, yes, I, I think that, please, please, please share with exclamation, exclamation, exclamation mark. <laughs> that would be great. In the meantime, this is my work for all of you that is in this room. If you could type in a few um, more negative affordances to um, mobile technologies, because it's not all sunshine and roses. Let me start with the positive, and in the meantime, you can populate the, the message board here on the right-hand side with the, the negative affordances. I've just made a start here. But the positive affordances to mobile technology and utilizing that in your training is the fact that there, it is, there's immediacy, immediacy to it. There are, oh, plagiarism, yes. Collaboration. It offers collaboration across the board um, in real time, asynchronous and synchronous solutions. Reflection, it's a reflective tool. I can capture my reflections. I can capture it in many different ways, either text, images, um, multimedia with regard to videos, audio. So it's a very powerful um, reflection tool. Interaction, yes, it leads to great interaction, um, allows for dialogue, continual dialogue. Um, authenticity, there is nothing as authentic as capturing your real life experiences. Locality, through the use of GPRS. Think of all the different type of um, solutions out there now, Foursquare, etc. Context, context plays heavily into this, and we'll look at um, the influence of culture um, a little bit later. It leads to inquiry, learning, and we can have our, our preferences, personal preferences with regard to learning. But the negative affordances, and I can't see any of you on the right hand side, you have, are not participating here. Although, Paige, yes, you did offer something here, plagiarism. Plagiarism, yes. Increased speed of content update needed, yes, that's another one. Um, and that feeds into the immediacy, because resources need to be updated continuously to stay current and to um, feed into the, the locality of, a, of a, um, a solution. That becomes paramount. So I think, I wonder if I can address time that into here. No, I can't. I'll do that afterwards. So privacy issues, yes. That is a big problem. Privacy, costly. We don't know what the total cost to end user is in many cases. When you're designing our solutions, we think um, very much utopian and um, we think top of the range or we think of, we don't consider chunking our, our content for smaller data packages because you don't always consider the total cost to end user. Um, and that is a big thing, and, and I, I should have actually spent the whole slide on total cost to end user, because many times our training does not even um, think about that at all. The time-consuming aspect of it, that is massive. Um, yes, oops, I agree with you, there's less strong relations because of the fact that it happens in a virtual space. 
if it's not face to face, if I can't see my neighbour, I don't, I don't really worry about the impact on that particular person too much. Barriers to entry can be maybe too high, yes, I agree with you. The danger of the trainer not accessing feedback from the learner and content not being end user centric. Haha. -ha. So maybe in the discussions after after this in our Google group, we should look at the the end user specifically. What are the, the total cost to end user and what is the what happens if the content isn't tailored tailored specifically for the end user, not end user centric. Especially the content and the context that um, that becomes paramount to this. So I think in our, in our Google Groups discussions after this, we can spend some time in looking at the negative affordances. Adele, you've got a comment. Poor teacher has an extended day, and a classroom and private life becomes one and the same. And she's never off duty. Yes, that is a serious problem. Um, and that also feeds back into Elizabeth's comment with regard to uh, not ac accessing feedback. If that pyramid of, on the second slide or third slide, if the base of that pyramid is too big for the number of trainers that are assigned to the number of trainees, if that ratio is, is skewed, then that will become a problem because then the, the feedback is not accessed and therefore the loop cannot be closed between the, the trainer and the user and therefore our iterations then collapse. Well, we've got two more comments here on the screen. Yes, content must be delivered in a manner language style that suits the learning style of the end user. That is very correct, and I think we'll get to that when you get to the last a few last slides. Um, create an inequality in classroom, have and the haven't. Yes, that's another debate with regard to um, do we wait till everybody has the same devices and access to the same technology before we embark on training? Um, is that really um, ethically responsible or not? That is the whole separate conversation on its own. And there's no time off from providing our services. Yes, and I think that is why we, we need to set very strict parameters. Um, if we look at on that slide now, slide number 15, and I think I'm going to rush ahead now. Pedagogical considerations, we need to look at our content, audience, goals, media, what is our development and design approach and what are implementation strategies? How many master trainers, how many trainers, how do we cascade it down that, um, that waterfall? And now we, we also need to look at the, and recognize the fact that we are not, in our training and training the trainers, we are not necessarily training um, learners. And that is why we, we move away from pedagogy and pedagogy um, has and this is now a very quick interpretation of pedagogy, but it is to lead a child. It is to facilitate the learning of a child. Where androgyny, it's more a question of an adult that is learning. Um, and the adult is very different to a child in learning, and we need to recognize that when we are looking at, at training the trainers. Because people, as professionals, are already at the pinnacle of their career, and what they might be lacking in technological knowledge, they have got, um, they make up for content knowledge. So it's important to keep these four things in mind, or these four aspects, when we're training with adults. And the first one is that they have moved already from dependency to self-directedness. They know what they want from training. They know what they've come to learn. Um, they also draw on their reservoir of experience of learning over the years, the accumulation of their professionalism over the years. Um, they are ready to learn when they assume new roles because they they can also they, through their professionalism they they understand that their role in society is changing and they also want to solve problems and, and apply new knowledge immediately. So what they've learned today in their training they want to apply tomorrow and learn from the application of it. Now this is a beautiful little photograph. It was one of our mobile training session. That is the personal nature of mobile technology. It's mine, and I will look after it and use it where I see fit. Um, so when we look at adultery, we look at um, how adults best learn. They they learn, and this is important for trainers to keep this in mind. They know they want to learn. 
Um, but they also want to have some say in what they learn, why they learn and how they learn it. So the personal preferences becomes paramount. Um, I've not taken my eye off the side here. I don't see there's any other comments here. Um, and they, they prefer learning in a cooperative learning climate. They learn enough to learn with others, but they also learn they want to have some autonomy over what they learn and when they learn. Now, one of the bigger aspects, and I think that has been neglected in the past with regard to train the trainer, is exploring and valuing diversity. Um, and I think, okay, the class will end in five minutes, so I need to move a little bit through here. Now, the broad definition of cultural diversity is that it is more than race and ethnicity. It encompasses values, lifestyle, and social norms, and includes issues such as different communication styles, mannerisms, ways of dressing, family structures, tradition, time, or orientation, and response to authority. That, that is very important because for trainers, sometimes when they go out and they're confronted with a different society, it is a culture shock to them. Um, they have not in the past had to contend with socioeconomic status of a community or of the sexual orientation or how people manage conflict. Um, what is it, uh, accepted in one culture is not um, necessarily uh, accepted in another. Perspectives on time, South African time or African time as we know it, it's, it, it's, it the broad definition of time is expanded there where we say <laughs> it's one thing to be on time but Africa, you are expected to be in time. It's a totally different concept. So it's important to remember in your training that you are yourself at all times. And um, that is where the trainer mindset comes in. The trainer is supposed to provide new perspectives on old issues, to give advice to move forward, to show understanding, um, to present clear and direct feedback, cr to create a rapport and trust, um, to monitor progress and also to cause to create course champions within a community so that when you know, the trainer extracts himself, then there is some person that is left behind. Now this brings it is a picture of Adele doing training with the Dr. Lowell's. There's a group of teachers here. And the question here is what are traditional models of teaching? Um, what are our traditional models of training? Is it one to one? Is it role reversal? In this space, we had learners here in the front training our trainers. So the, the whole authority has been, um, level of authorities have been changed. Our collaboration, and then we have the implication of technology. Now, I'm just quickly going through these last few slides because our time is up. And um, I, I can post these two Google groups. But at the moment, where we are at, at the moment is with training the trainer. It is important at all times, and that is why I use this picture here, is that there's a little scene in the avatar, the movie the avatar, where these two um, technologically created creatures say to each other, I see you, which means that we connect as human beings. And once we connect as human beings, we can learn from each other. So when you're training the trainers, it is no, it, there is no technocentric approach. It's not what the technology can do for me. It's how I can use the technology to empower me to do what I want to do. And that is the message that I would like to leave you with today. So our last slide is the activities for the rest of the, the week. First, I'd like to study the complexity of developing material and executing training in a developing world context. And we're going to do that through um, the Google Groups. And the second one is to do it in um, developed world scenarios, because those are very different. So at this point in time, I'd like to say thank you very much. Um, any comments or any questions, um, we can continue this conversation in the Google Groups. And as some of you have indicated, you would like to learn a little bit more about the specific technological solutions and um, how we train using different scenarios. But I would like to refer you as well to Adele's presentation of early in the week where she spoke specifically with regard to what kind of mobile solutions we are looking at um, 
when we are training. Now, thank you very much for the applause. <laughs> I can, if I can, I can give some applause back. Let me quickly just find a hand. So thank you very much. And I will um, meet you in the, um, the room or the Google Groups at some stage. And then to everybody that's finished work and needs to continue this work, um, good luck. And I'm going to ask my husband now to light the bra fire so that he can also celebrate Diversity Day in South Africa. Take care, everyone. Bye.